Good morning. Welcome to our simulation lab at El Dorado, uh, where we are going to be conducting another nursing skill, a rather simple skill in fact, uh, called bandaging. And we are going to show you several types of bandaging styles today. Uh, before we do that, we'd like to talk a little bit about the tool that we're going to use. Uh, bandaging, as I mentioned, is a basic nursing skill. Every nurse should know how to apply appropriate bandage. And this is even important, even in basic first aid that anyone can be taught how to apply a bandage correctly. What is a bandage? A bandage is simply a length of fabric. Um, in the clinical setting, we tend to use commercially prepared bandages that are made from an elastic, porous, light, breathable cotton material of appropriate lengths. The length of most bandages are about three feet and they come in various widths. You have our two-inch approximate bandage. These would be used, for example, if you want to wrap a finger or even a small wrist, a very small person. You have your three-inch, and you can use your finger as an indicator of how wide a bandage is. This is a three-inch bandage. This would be a four-inch, and this would be a six-inch. The larger size bandages we tend to use for wrapping a, a limb, like a leg, head, or a stump. We also have our commercially prepared slings that we use for supporting a limb, uh, the arm particularly, and these also come in these folded packs. And what I wanted to stress about a bandage is that it can be improvised. Yes, we have our commercially prepared items that you can get on any, at any pharmacy in any clinical setting, but in an emergency situation, you can improvise and use almost anything. A belt can become a sling if you need to support a broken arm. A belt can also be used to support a, a lower leg or so if someone is injured and you need to keep the leg elevated. A sleeve of a sweater or a garment can also be used as a bandage in an emergency situation. If you have someone who is bleeding and you want to stop bleeding, you can tear off a length of fabric from almost anything, a tie, and make a sling or a bandage as appropriate until you can seek appropriate medical attention and the wound can be dressed properly. Uh, something else I need to mention about bandages. They are disposable. Once used, you usually remove them and throw them away. And uh, you can use several different types of bandages depending on what you need to support. And that is what a bandage is generally used for, to support a limb, cover a wound, to immobilize a body part, and to secure, uh, basically to secure and keep something safe and protected. So you can use bandages to cover a dressing, you can use bandages to splint uh, a leg, you can use bandages to support a broken limb. And that's the general usage of bandages. Uh, so today we are going to demonstrate to you several uh, types of bandages, rolls and folds of bandages. And why we're going to do that is because depending on the fold you use, uh, it will indicate what type of injury the person has, where the injury is, the size of the part that you're bandaging is important as well, and that will determine what type of fold and rolls you use to secure the wound, immobilize the part, and basically to keep a wound or, or injured area safe. So I have my lovely assistant, Miss Poiwing, who is going to be our patient today. And she has a lovely exposed limb. So that's what we're going to use to demonstrate our first bandage type, which is a simple circular bandage. So we're going to use our two inch bandage for that. It's a very small bandage. So it's going to cover a, a finger or a wrist area of a very small wrist or small person, a child. So with bandages, you always want to make sure that the bandage that you use is clean firstly, and that when you hold the bandage, you call the opening this is the first part of the bandage and this is the roll of the bandage. This is held securely in your hand and the opening of the bandage always faces the roof or the ceiling before you start to roll and to wrap. You want to inspect the side that you wrap, ensuring that the patient has some sensation above yes. and below the part. And you want to ensure that because when you wrap a bandage, it should never be something that constricts or causes further harm to the patient. The bandage is supposed to help cover or support the site. And if the bandage itself is not applied appropriately, it can hurt the patient, which is what you want to avoid in time. So she has feeling and sensation above yes. the wound. 
and yes. below the wound. Can you wiggle your fingers for me? Lovely. As you start wrapping your bandage, you ask the patient at intervals if it's too tight. And if they indicate it is, you can simply unroll and then re-roll at a, a little slacker. The bandages, as I mentioned before, are elastic cotton. So they have a lot of flexibility in terms of the pulling and the usage. The tighter you pull the bandage, the more compression or pressure you put on the wound site. And the less tightly you wrap the bandage, it's a little more comfortable for the patient. But it should never be too slack that it can easily fall off and too tight that it restricts circulation. So we call this an anchor. Your first roll goes one turn completely over on itself. And that's the anchor bandage. And when you place your anchor bandage, you should be able to pull the bandage a little bit and it not just pull off. So that's why it's called an anchor, so that your bandage can stay securely in place. We're doing the simple circular bandage, which is simply turning the bandage over and over and over on itself. Just like a circle, around and around and around until your bandage is completely rolled onto your patient. When you get to the edge of the bandage, which is very important, how you secure the bandage is equally important to how the bandage is wrapped. We would suggest that you use a safety pin or a simple tape to secure the bandage in place. When you open your bandage, they tend to come with these metal clips. We advise that you don't use those because they can come off easily and they can also be a cause for injury for the patient. They can pinch and hurt your patient. So you don't want to use those, especially in the clinical setting. You can simply secure it in place with tape or with a large safety pin. So this is how your bandage would look if it's a simple circular bandage. Bandages are removed by simply unrolling and you can discard. Our next bandage would be the circular bandage. We'll use the forearm for this type of bandaging and we'll use the four inch bandage as well. So now we're going to do the simple spiral. So we did a circular bandage previously and now we're going to do a simple spiral. I want you to look at the bandage itself, the width of the bandage, and imagine that it's in three, horizontally. Those thirds are going to be important when we start turning and folding the other, other consecutive types of bandaging because I want you to be able to visualize those lines when we make our turns and our folds. So we start with a simple circular roll and anchor our bandage in place. Now we are simply going to go upwards the limb in a spiral, just like a tornado. Each time we go upward on the limb, we are going to cover two thirds of the previous fold. So this is the fold that we're looking at now. I'm going to cover two thirds of it. So one area, one, two thirds using my next turn. Just like that. Now this fold, I'm going to cover two thirds of it with my next turn. Similarly, two thirds with my next turn. Is it too tight? No, it's good. Okay. And I will continue rolling my bandage. with a safety pin or secure in place with simple tape. This type of bandage would be used if the patient has a wound on the arm 
And you want to be mindful of the fact that whenever you're making your turns and your folds, that if the patient's wound is on the inner aspect of the arm, you don't want to secure the bandage, the end of it, exactly where the wound is, because that will be putting unnecessary pressure on an area that is already sensitive to pain. So I'll unwrap my, ba my bandage now. And I'm going to demonstrate another type of bandaging called figure eight. So the figure eight is so named because of the pattern that is made when you uh, use the bandage to make the folds and the tits. So you start with anchoring your bandage with your simple circular fold. Bandage is anchored in place. Now you go up around the limb and come down. So I'm making the pattern on the inner aspect so that you can see it. I'm going to go up again and then down. I'm going to go up again above this fold and come down slightly to cover two thirds of the previous fold. Up again, down. Up again, down, up again, and I've reached the end of my bandage, which I can secure with tape. This pattern that you're seeing here of folds almost looks like a figure eight, hence the name figure eight bandaging. See that? Now you can wrap this and you can put the figure eight on the inner aspect, on the outer aspect, or the lateral aspect, depending on where you want it. Keep in mind again that wherever you put more folds and turns, that is, an, that is where the pressure, most of the pressure is with your bandage. The head is a very unique shape, so the bandage that is required to secure a head injury is a very unique shape. We tend to use a large width, the six inch bandage. Uh, this requires help as well if you want it to, to be secure on the patient, so you usually have someone to assist you to help keep the folds in place as you make your turns. So this procedure, you'll definitely have to have the cooperation of your patient who will need to be in the upright position for you to be able to access all around and behind them, sides of them and in front of them as well. So you inform and explain to your patient and you can proceed once they cooperate. So we're going to apply your bandage now soon. I have my assistant Miss Poiwing with me, Miss Poiwing, and we are going to cover your head. Uh, this is called a, a head bandage or when we're finished with it, it it's also called a turban because that's exactly what it looks like. So we have our bandage and we start from the forehead to the back of the head and you see where my assistant has placed her hand to keep the fold in place and then I'm going to return the fold up to the lateral side covering this side entirely of the head I'm going to return the fold to the back of the head I am keeping my hand in front and pinning the bandage in place so it doesn't come off I'm going to make the fold again covering the right side of the skull completely. Now from this point, you can see that the entire circumference of the head is covered so that I can now start making my circular turns to cover my edges and to keep the bandage in place. You want to be mindful not to cover the ears completely when you're doing this bandage, so just visualize where the ears are so that you don't cover the patient's ears completely. You also don't want to cover the eyes completely in the front. And you 
continue making your circular turns until you reach the end of your bandage. Again, when you're securing in place, if the patient happens to have a wound on the left side of the head, this is not where you want to secure the bandage. The bandage are very um, easy to manipulate. You can fold it and tape it on the right side, which is safer, or you can even cut your bandage and secure so that it is shorter. And when secured in place, that's what it looks like. The turban. If you need to, you can do two wraps or two bandages to cover a surface area or secure the bandage in place, especially for a patient with critical head injuries, if they have bleeding of the site anywhere in the head, you can use multiple bandages. And that's the, that's the practical thing about bandages. You can use as many as you need for the purpose that you need it for. If you were to arrest bleeding, you can use two bandages to do that. If the patient's recovering from a particular type of head surgery, you may need to use more than one bandage to secure your wound in place and to make sure that the wound stays clean and covered. So that is your turban or your head bandage. And the next bandage that we're going to show you, thank you very much, sir, is the stump. For those patients who would have recently had uh, surgery to remove the lower limb, our mannequin in particular today has had an above knee amputation, an AKE. Uh, the reason why we want to specify that is because the, there's no knee present, therefore there's no joint present. Uh, having an angle usually makes it much easier to secure a bandage in place. So in the absence of an angle, you're dealing with a very unique shaped uh, limb and you have to be very specific about the way that you attach the bandage so that it stays in place when you finished bandaging. So this is our stump above the knee. We would assume that our patient would have had a, a, a wound that runs laterally, which is across, is usually the way that it is cut. So you'll probably see a suture line at the end. We want to specify that because when we're wrapping the bandage, we want to ensure that we wrap and bandage the edges particularly so that we maintain the shape of the limb, which usually starts wide and then tapers off as it narrows to the knee. If you don't wrap the bandage like that, later on when our patient who may be uh, looking to use a prosthesis, if they may have complications fitting an appropriate prosthesis because the limb is very wide at the base here when it should have been more tapered and narrow. So that is something to keep in mind when you're wrapping a stump. Alright, so you anchor the bandage. But you'll have to do so around the thigh. Similarly to when you were doing the turban, you'll have to come upwards and make a fold and then downwards to cover the entire surface area, keeping in mind that you want to pinch and make sure that the edges of the wound taper when you're finished bandaging. So you can make that fold again. This looks very stiff and harder to manipulate, but any patient who has a stump, the actual patient, they may be able to raise the limb a bit more so that you have more room to manipulate and secure your bandage in place. And when you reach the end, you can secure your bandage in place with tape. And that is your stump bandage. In any setting, if you need to, you can apply simple bandaging to immobilize a part, secure a wound, uh, keep a dressing in place. All right, thank you very much. Uh, as we're finished with the bandages, the crepe bandages in particular, we are going to show you another type of bandaging. We use a sling, and the sling is very popular. 
in many instances where the patient will have an injury of the arms. And the sling is used to secure the arm in place, to immobilize the arm, and to keep it from further injury by mobility. So essentially, that's what a, a sling will do, is immobilize an upper limb. Slings are triangular in shape, usually made of lightweight brown cotton, and that's because it is non-porous, um, very easy to manipulate, and very affordable. Anyone can buy a yard of brown cotton and make two slings and keep for your first aid kit at home, in your car, in your workplace for any usage that it may come for. And these can come in very handy in many settings. So today we're simply going to put a sling on a patient who's injured her arm. Uh, you want to open your sling. They come in different sizes. I believe this one would be um, a large. So based on the size of your patient, you want to pick a sling that may be the appropriate size. You don't want to pick a sling that is too large because then you'll have a lot of extra fabric that you'll need to tuck in and fold in other places that it shouldn't be. And also it looks much neater if you use an appropriate size. So the thing about a sling and how easy it is to tie is that the longest side, because it's a triangle, as you can see, the longest side is placed along the length of the patient's body. Simple. And the point of the triangle here will be placed at the elbow of the arm that is injured. Yes? So Ms. Poiwing's left arm is injured, so I'm going to put the point of the sling at her left elbow and the length of the sling along the length of her body with one side just falling over her shoulder. Let the client or the injured person or the patient manipulate their own arm. You don't want to have to take the arm and make any adjustments to it because you may be causing undue harm to the patient. So let them hold and support the arm while you secure the sling in place. That way, it's comfortable for them. Now I'm going to take the end of the sling, which will be falling to the base of the patient, and I'm going to bring it up. This side will be placed over her opposite shoulder. Sorry. And this side will be placed on the shoulder that is injured. If I can turn this poiring around, I'm going to show you where you're going to tie the sling, not at directly at the base of the neck, which can become very uncomfortable and irritating if you put a knot there. So you're going to tie a simple reef knot. Reef knot, for those of us who remember, in our Scouts and Girls Guide, is a simple knot that requires us to tie right over left and then left over right. It looks like this. When you tie a reef knot, specifically, it tends to be flatter so that it's not a hard, lumpy, stony type thing on the back of the patient's neck or shoulder. So it's a flatter knot that fits nicely just behind the patient's head or neck. And then when you turn the patient around, you can manipulate the front of the sling. So you'll see in this patient, it just has a little bit of what would look like excess fabric. This is the easy part because this can be folded You can pin in place, safety pins only please, or you can simply tape in place and secure. At this point, you would look at the patient's arm with, which is supported in the sling, and you want to ensure that the sling goes just beyond the wrist, so the arm is supported fully, and you want to ask your patient, is that comfortable? Yes, can yes. you wiggle your fingers for me? Good. And the patient has a usually very good immobility of the arm in a sling without causing undue injury or further discomfort. And that is our sling. With all types of bandages, we just want to remind you to ask the person, when you're finished, is it too tight? Is it comfortable? 
Always observe the distal part of the wound or the end where the fingertips are. Ask them to wiggle the fingertips and look at the condition of the fingertips. It should be pink and the patient should be able to move, wiggle their fingers or even wiggle their toes if it's a leg that you would have bandaged easily without feeling constricted or painful distress. Thank you very much and that would conclude our bandaging sessions for today.